because somebody's on the phone. And it's not me this time. That's good. OK, valvular incompetence. So most of what we've looked at has been in arteries. And again, thrombus formation can be arteries or veins. Uh, embolus can travel through arteries or veins. Uh, however, valvular incompetence, only va veins have valves, so this is a venous issue. Uh, when somebody, especially with aging, um, or somebody who's sedentary, for example, those valves are actually pretty delicate. They're derived from the endothelium, right? That tunica intima is what the source for these valves. And the issue there is that with age, they can become incompetent. They can weaken. Um, if they weaken or uh, become insufficient, then blood will not be squeezed progressively towards the heart as easily, right? And that's really just going to tie into things like varicose veins, for example. It's pretty straightforward. Fun fact about veins is they're almost always more superficial than the artery. That's the general rule of thumb is the vein is more superficial than the artery that corresponds to it. So that's why varicose veins are going to appear in a very outward way. Um, and again, remember, the function of those veins is every time the skeletal muscle pump squeezes on that blood, it's going to be moved towards the heart. It can only go in one direction. A varicose vein, vein just means it, it can't, it's not being squeezed in that direction all the time. Yes? Right. Yeah, I wonder if spider veins, I wonder if they're even properly named. See. Right, and everybody calls them spider veins. Um, or almost if it's more bursting, but you can fix spider veins in some interesting ways. Small twisted blood vessels, so they're twisted. Yeah. <laughs> now recall that. When we're picking up that excess fluid from the interstitial space, that happens through the lymphatic system. That lymphatic system goes to progressively larger lymphatic vessels. And on the way, you're going to find some lymph nodes that are going to filter that fluid. And they're going to look for pathogens. And if they find them, they're going to initiate an immune response. And that's all very good for you until you've had your lymph nodes removed because of cancer, probably. Uh, lymph nodes being removed is going to cut off that pathway of returning fluid back to the cardiovascular system, which is going to lead very commonly to lymphedema. Lymphedema is going to be a permanent problem, a permanent concern for anybody who's had lymph nodes removed. That's why when we're dealing with cancers, yeah, we want, we'll probably want to remove some proximal lymph nodes. You want to remove as few lymph nodes as possible while still maximizing your chance of having captured every cancer cell. That's a challenging thing to do, right? Uh, there is a second, there, or there is an iatrogenic lymphedema. Why do they have lymphedema? We don't know. Um, or we caused it, sorry, idiopathic. Uh, this is iatrogenic, which means we caused it with lymph node removal. I said that wrong. I'm not doing great today. So again, bilaterally symmetrical humans means normal leg, lymphedema leg. Comparing contrast is relatively easy. There's lymphedema in the arm as well. Does that all make sense? OK. Let's go to blood pressure. Lots of things are controlling your blood pressure. So many things are controlling your blood pressure. Uh, your blood pressure is determined by, for example, cardiac output, systemic vascular resistance. Cardiac output itself is determined by heart rate and stroke volume. Your systemic vascular resistance is determined by arterial radius as well as, um, yeah, I mean, vasoconstriction. And you've got your RAS pathway too. How do you guys feel about that RAS pathway? Feel good about RAS, renin and geotensin aldosterone system? Garbage. <laughs> It's garbage. Renin and angiotensin aldosterone. You're going to need that renin and angiotensin aldosterone system coming up here for patho. It's going to be all over the place because it does involve multiple systems. Your kidneys, your liver, your lungs are even involved. Your adrenal cortex is involved, and all of that's going to ultimately control your blood pressure. That means you're going to see it in all of those systems independently. And all of it's going to ultimately impact your blood volume, therefore your blood pressure. Higher blood volume equals higher blood pressure. Excellent. 
I say Renan, some people say Renan. Your mileage may vary. Let me see if there's anything hidden here. Sometimes there is. I don't know why. There is. Garbage. I'm a garbage person. Sorry, guys. Okay. Cardiac output, which we're going to call CO, which will be covered later again, uh, is a major determinant of systemic blood pressure. There's going to be systemic vascular resistance. That's going to be determined by the arterial radi radius and the rest of the entire cardiovascular system. Cardiac output, that formula is stroke volume times heart rate, right? This should all be review. This should all be really super familiar. I don't think this is all ringing a bell. Stroke volume is the amount you eject with every heartbeat. We usually measure that in milliliters. And heart rate is just your normal heart rate, how many beats per minute. That means the value for cardiac output is going to be measured in, what's the value? Milliliters per minute. Excellent. So cardiac output's a super, super important factor. You will be able to cardiac output. Uh, some more vocab that's review here. End diastolic volume is the filling of the ventricles. When the ventricles are fully relaxed, they fill with blood. And a lot of things are going to determine EDV, including preload, how much blood makes it back to the heart from the systemic vessels, right? Do you guys remember afterload? What's afterload? So you're thinking of end systolic volume. So end systolic volume is the definition of amount of blood left in the ventricle after contraction. This is the water bottle. Yeah. So you've got end diastolic. That's the amount before when it's relaxed. Then there's end systolic volume, which is the amount after it's contracted. It's not a perfect system, so there will be a little bit of blood left. If there's a lot of blood left, you got a problem, right? But I'm asking about, we talked about preload and how that relates to EDV. What's our definition of afterload? Not exactly. Afterload. This is a commonly missed question on my AMP2 exams. So, so when your heart contracts, is it contracting into a vacuum? It's contracting into a system, a system that has systemic vascular resistance. So it's kind of like me trying to eject. Sorry for the noises this is making on the recording. That's probably going to be very unpleasant. Um, I'll stop doing that now that you get the idea. So the heart's mm -hmm. going to contract against resistance, right? After load is the resistance the heart must overcome in order to eject. And it's going to be determined, for example, by systemic vascular resistance. What that's going to mean for us is if you have high blood pressure, you have higher afterload. Your heart's going to have to work harder to push blood into that system. Do we like it when the heart has to work harder? What problem is that going to cause? Is it going to get weaker? It's going to get thicker, cardiomegaly. You're going to hypertrophy. Your cardiomyocytes are going to hypertrophy. You're going to have cardiomegaly. You're going to have to work extra hard. And then what's going to happen to your stroke volume? It's going to decrease. What's going to happen to your cardiac output? Decrease. You still have high blood pressure. Now your cardiac output is low. What's going to happen to your heart rate? It's going to increase. You're going to compensate. And yeah. Bummer. Bummer is the right word. So to increase cardiac output, increase stroke volume, or increase heart rate, or increase both, but not always to good effect. Now again, systolic blood pressure, if we don't specify atrial systole or ventricular systole, which one are we talking about? Ventricular systole. Systolic blood pressure peaks during ventricular systole. Diastolic blood pressure is the lowest pressure. Stroke volume is the primary factor influencing systolic pressure. Systemic vascular resistance is the major determinant of diastolic pressure. So we do have this also concept of mean arterial pressure. You have your systolic pressure right around 120. You have your diastolic pressure right around 80. 
you're actually going to spend two times as much time in diastole as you are in systole. So we'll actually consider the significance of diastolic pressure twice as much. So we'll, consider, we'll count diastolic twice, then we'll add in systolic, and then we'll divide it by three, because we put three numbers in. If you're not a math person, you're just going to have to roll with that. If you are a math person, that made a lot of sense. Yeah. Rob, with me on that one? Okay. So short-term regulation, we're going to have epinephrine and norepinephrine acting on alpha and beta receptors. Alpha-1 in things like smooth muscle ar of arterioles causing vasoconstriction. Beta-1 being located in the heart. And that's going to change, like we said, mean arterial pressure. Uh, let's see, these arrows are not quite where they should be anymore. Let's try to figure out where they belong. I think that's just stimulatory to increase. So I think they're just both going up. It's fine. Okay, chemoreceptors in the medulla vasomotor center increase the sympathetic nervous system activity. Um, you do have a little sinus in your carotid artery, so that's detecting your sort of um, chemical milieu. Do you have enough oxygen? Do you cause your carbon dioxide level? And that's actually going to inform that brain on what to do with your cardiac output. And baroreceptors, too, I should mention, aside from chemoreceptors. If you haven't already started dealing with alpha and beta adrenergic receptors in farm, you will soon. It's coming. Winter is coming. Um, and again, that's going to activate some metabotropic receptors to change things inside of your cells. Uh, we're not going to really deal with the cellular pathway, though. You're welcome. Now it's time to review RAS. There's a lot of review today. I think there's these things that I spent all this time in AMP2 on, but they're just too big to get all of them once at AMP2, and it's worth reviewing just a little bit. But it's going to go a lot faster than it did in AMP2, so buckle up. Where did renin come from? The kidneys. Kidneys released renin. So your kidneys are controlling your urinary output, which means they're controlling your blood volume. They have detection of your blood pressure all of the time, right? If you have low blood pressure, they are going to release renin, and that's going to convert angiotensinogen into angiotensin 1. Where did angiotensinogen come from? The liver. The liver was already producing angiotensinogen. It's just in an inactive state, so in the presence of renin, now we convert it to angiotensin 1. Does anybody know where angiotensin converting enzyme comes from? lungs well done all over the place but also especially the lungs so if there's angiotensin 1 and you also have ACE the angiotensin converting enzyme then you can convert into angiotensin 2 which is going to cause a few things even behavioral things like drinking more water which is not on here but it'll cause vasoconstriction and most significant for our purposes is that it's going to cause a release of aldosterone from where adrenal cortex you guys are rocking this Adrenal cortex is going to release aldosterone, which is going to cause sodium retention. And because you retain sodium, where does water go? To stuff. Because you retain sodium, you therefore also retain water. And by the way, aldosterone also causes secretion or excretion of potassium, which will matter to you at some point. So aldosterone release is going to cause sodium, therefore water retention, which will increase your blood volume, which will... Increase your blood pressure. Well done. So yes, you need to know what organs those came from because we're going to deal with every system and every system can impact this, right? Uh, you need to know what the substance is, what it converts, and where. And I believe I have put a chart onto your worksheet today to this effect for you to fill out in detail. Yeah, that was well done. That was very well done. How's everybody else feeling about it except for those two? <laughs> okay, uh, so RAS is part of long-term regulation of systemic uh, blood pressure. Um, 
You're also going to have some other hormones related to blood pressure. ANP, atrial nutriuretic peptide, does have a couple of different names. It's actually released by the heart. If the heart detects that it's overdilated, that the baroreceptors in the heart wall say, oh, this is stretched way too much, it's going to release ANP, and that's actually going to make you pee out more. That's going to decrease your blood volume. That's going to decrease your blood pressure. Actually, let's go back to RAS for just a second. We've got a lot of drugs for this. What's an ACE inhibitor going to do and where and why? Go for it. <laughs> okay, so where's ACE on this chart? In between angiotensin 1 and angiotensin 2, if you have an ACE inhibitor, that means you are blocking the activity of this enzyme. So now you will no longer have what? Angiotensin 2. Therefore, the rest of this will not happen, and you will not have the mechanism to increase your blood pressure. You will not retain as much water. You will not be thirsty and go drink water. You will not vasoconstrict. Your blood pressure will be lower. So are there providing therapy like if you have a blood pressure and something bad, like if you didn't drink enough water and didn't feel all that good? You do have some other controls of fluid homeostasis. Uh, I've actually had the same question when I first learned this in undergrad. It seems like a bad plan to just entirely block the thing that increases your blood pressure. Uh, for our purposes, and again, this is a good farm question too, but um, for our purposes, it's fine. Okay. They're going to be fine. Um, now, what about beta blockers? What are we blocking? Beta. What, what's beta? <laughs> your heart. Yeah, so beta-1 receptors are receptors for norepinephrine, and if you block them, then that norepinephrine cannot bind to the beta-1 receptors, which means you cannot increase your heart rate or your heart's contractility, and therefore your blood pressure will be managed that way, because that affects your cardiac output. Isn't it bad, like, for guys to take, doesn't make it, like, harder to get like, Harder to get to an erection? Um, I, feel like might. I, that I don't know. Good Ashley Watson question. Probably. Okay, RAS. Uh, ANP doing the opposite, decreasing blood pressure by making you pee more. Endothelin 1, your blood vessel walls themselves, those cells can have an impact in uh, blood pressure as well. They actually can release their own vasodilator, such as nitric oxide. It's pretty cool. And endothelin 1. Uh, vasodilator. Actually, sorry, uh, endothelin one is a vasoconstrictor. I have it here in my notes. Endothelin one is a peptide that is a patent vasoconstrictor. Nitric oxide is a, a basically a hormone. It's a gaseous hormone that can cause vasodilation. I was mixing them up. Okay, throughout your circadian rhythm, your blood pressure does normally fluctuate. I don't think I'm going to hold you to super chiasmatic nucleus as much as I love it. Um, and I'm a big friend of it. You have bought an internal clock. You have this nucleus. It's inside of your hypothalamus. What that should You could just write hypothalamus and keep it simple for yourself. Um, you do have this nucleus in your hypothalamus that's rhythmically releasing neurotransmitters once per second. Depending on your age, it may be a little bit more, a little bit less. That's why time goes fast when you're a kid and slow when you're old. Or the other way around, sorry, slow when you're young, fast when you're old. That's why my years are just going by like, like lightning because I'm old. Um, but that's determining your circadian rhythm. Your internal body clock is determining your circadian rhythm. Uh, people do tend to have a peak in systemic blood pressure right before waking. And that will be hormonally mediated as part of that response to the circadian rhythm. Things like growth hormone, things like cortisol change over the course of your night. Some of them drop, some of them raise, and those will have synergistic effects on blood pressure. Let's talk about hypertension. So again, there's going to be primary versus secondary. There's going to be primary hypertension where it's something to do with your blood vessels, 
and there's going to be many forms of secondary hypertension. Something's going on with an organ that plays a role in blood vessel or, sorry, uh, blood pressure regulation, and now you have hypertension as a result of that. So responsible for annual death worldwide, 7 million people. It's not a good thing. As I understand it, we keep changing the standard for what normal blood pressure is. Last I heard, 120 and over 80 is now considered sort of the high end of normal. Last I checked, you can correct me on that. I'm not a clinician. I'm right? Cool. I'm glad about that. Okay, there's actually an update here. If you have the old edition versus the new edition, they have put in some up-to-date changes in there that I do approve of. Usually I, I rag on textbooks, but this time I'm going to say they did good. Um, so primary tension, hypertension, also known as essential hypertension, generally considered idiopathic. If nothing else has gone wrong, why do you have systemic high blood pressure? But it's going to be correlated with some things we do understand, such as obesity. So it used to be rare prior to the age of 10. This is the big change between the old edition and the new edition, because guess what? It's now becoming more and more common prior to the age of 10. We are finding more and more diagnoses of primary hypertension, especially in the obese pediatric population. And again, we could go all over the place talking about obesity, and I want to be very sensitive about it uh, because people are looking for a genetic basis. They are looking for an environmental factors beyond just people have no impulse control and it's human fault. It's really not people's fault when they're overweight. Um, but we do have to be careful with that because there are adverse health outcomes when people are obese, regardless of the cause of that. No. Right. Yeah. It's like there should be just an entire conversation about obesity here. We just don't have the time for it. So I'm using a sort of cultural shorthand for let's be respectful for people of all weights. Uh, so again, risk factors for hyper primary hypertension. You can't change your family history. Your age is only going one way. You can't change that. You can't change your genetics or your ethnicity. It's really just about your genes. Um, you can change your diet. You can change your lifestyle. Again, I want to point out your textbooks saying you can control your obesity. There is not one single study that says this is how you can lose weight permanently. That doesn't exist. We've got a lot of, you know, long, large-scale lifestyle changes that people can make and, I, and hopefully become a healthier weight. But for very many people, even once we give them a healthier lifestyle, that weight does not permanently come off. The people on The Biggest Loser, they've almost all gained back all of that weight and then some. Yeah, I agree. Uh, metabolic syndromes, L you can treat. Elevated blood glucose levels, being diabetic, you can treat. Elevated total cholesterol, you can treat or have lifestyle or dietary things that you change. Alcohol and smoking, hypothetically, you can change. Again, there's a whole conversation we could have about addiction there that is way more complex than we have time for. Okay, so primary hypertension um, in children, if the mother smoked, if the mother had pregnancy-induced hypertension, if uh, there were bad, poor dietary habits before birth, low birth rate, followed by rapid growth, lower socioeconomic status. Really, when we're talking about obesity, if I was going to blame any one thing, I would say it's the food companies putting a ton of sugar and making our food addictive and bypassing satiety circuitry. The food we eat is very specially engineered to make us eat a lot of it. Um, and there's that cat out of, is out of the bag. There's no shoving it back in. So unless we just stop eating processed foods entirely, it's going to keep happening. And guess what? Those processed foods are really inexpensive. So socioeconomic status of uh, the family is absolutely going to impact people's health outcomes. Okay. So hypertension is a silent killer. The issue here is end organ damage. The hypertension is going to impact the capillary beds. And anytime you have capillary beds, which is literally everywhere, uh, you can have long-term high blood pressure causing damage to those capillary beds. 
So there's going to be just in a minute our difference between hypertensive urgency versus hypertensive emergency. And the difference is going to be end organ damage. The examples of end organ damage are going to be your kidneys are failing, your heart is failing, your um, retina, the blood vessels in your retina are bursting. Diabetic retinopathy, for example. Um, it is insane, I agree. <laughs> so like widespread hemorrhaging in small blood vessels as a result of high blood pressure. Uh, again, we can modify the lifestyle. We can treat any underlying disorders. There's the DASH diet, which you've probably heard a little bit. Fruits, vegetables, low fat, uh, low salt, all that good stuff. Again, none of those, you know, fat itself is not the culprit. Processed fat is probably the culprit in very, very large quantities. Salt is not the enemy. You need salt. It's just salt in very, very large quantities is the problem. But for a person who already has hypertension, cutting out salt is a nice shortcut to decreasing the amount of stuff that you have to draw water in. It's like the artificial salt? I have no idea, but probably. That sounds plausible. So potassium is, yeah. Yeah, I'm not into it. Just wait till we get to hyperkalemia and then we can talk about that. What kind of? Yeah, technically a lot of ions are salts. Potassium is a salt. Sodium is a salt. But that does not mean they taste like sodium. <laughs> Secondary hypertension means an organ is messed up and it's part of your blood pressure control, so you have hypertension. So in childhood, and again, this used to be in childhood if you have hypertension, it's probably a secondary hypertension. That's the old rule of thumb. Yeah, you probably have something like coarctation of the aorta, where the aorta is a lot thinner in at least one place than it should be, and it's lending the amount of blood that's making it out of the heart. Um, and that's altering your systemic blood pressure response. Absolutely. Yeah, you could have kidney failure, you could have liver failure, you could have, um, yeah, absolutely. And that would cause a secondary hypertension too. We will see hypertension in conjunction with renal disorders. Sleep apnea is also increasingly a problem. Um, and that can correlate with secondary hypertension. And again, sleep apnea, the increased rate of sleep apnea, yet again, we're going to blame on childhood obesity. Having larger structures is blocking airways. Having a thicker neck, yes. Okay. Uh, so renal artery stenosis, pregnancy, obesity with sleep apnea, Hyperaldosteronism. Remember, aldosterone is part of our RAS pathway too. It's going to cause water retention, the sodium retention, and potassium excretion. I'm going to say this word right here because it's one of my favorites pheochromocytoma. A good one, right? It's a secreting tumor of the adrenal medulla. It releases epinephrine and norepinephrine, which you already know is part of short term regulation of blood pressure. You guys starting to understand why I made you do those arrows in AMP2? All those correlations? Yep. That's playing the long game. Okay. I'm glad you found that funny. Okay. Hypertensive emergency versus urgency. As I mentioned, the difference is evidence of end organ damage. In an hypertensive urgency, there is an elevated spike of blood pressure. And it's going to be a scary spike, but for whatever reason, it's not causing end organ damage. Whereas in a hypertensive emergency, there is the same spike in blood pressure causing end organ damage. So, like when you're in pain and your blood pressure is high, do you cause pain like that? Do you get under like the hypertensive emergency or no? Good question. I'm not entirely sure. Um, I can kind of give you a personal anecdote on it. I had an ingrown toenail once upon a time after I hiked into the Grand Canyon and my blood pressure was considered prehypertensive and they put me on the DASH diet for the week. 
um, regardless of the source of it, I was considered prehypertensive at that time. Uh, I imagine the thing here is going to be you probably already had elevated blood pressure, and now some stimulus has triggered you into an extremely elevated blood pressure. Yeah. You like already were that's the more likely scenario. Again, ask a clinician. I'm just here for the physiology. I only know it if I teach it, unfortunately. Okay, um, so here are some examples of end organ damage. We worry about apoptosis of cells of the heart. We worry about fibrosis and scarring of the heart, uh, left ventricular hypertrophy. We worry about that leading to arrhythmias, heart failure, myocardial infarction, and that can kill you. We worry about vascular disorders in the brain, a stroke, cognitive disturbance that can kill you. We worry about your kidneys, a decline in glomerular filtration rate, everyone's favorite word. Proteinuria or albuminuria. What's albumin, albuminuria and what's it going to do? You're peeing out your albumin. What's that going to do systemically? Edema. Yep. Uh, that's going to be related to renal failure. So is uh, glomerular sclerosis leading to renal failure, which can kill you. So again, that's why it's an emergency. All of these things can kill you. All right. Uh, we already mentioned orthostatic, orthostatic or postural hypotension. That's going to be when you stand, you go to stand up and you feel really dizzy. We've all had that at some point. There's minor forms of it. There's also some more serious forms of it. And sometimes for some people, we're not self-diagnosing, we're not saying anybody has cardiovascular issues, but it can correlate with, it can be a sign of other cardiovascular issues. Um, so somebody who's frequently experiencing postural hypotension should probably have their cardiovascular system assessed. Could be sclerosis of arteries supplying the brain, for example. That would be an example of something that would cause really frequent postural hypertension. And of course, the problem here is if you're having frequent orthostatic postural hypertension, your heart rate is going to go up trying to push that blood up into your brain. You're going to be dizzy, you might have blurred vision, confusion, possible syncope. What's syncope? Passing out, temporary loss of confidence. So again, it's associated with cardiovascular disease, and it's a risk factor for stroke, cognitive impairment, and death. That doesn't mean if you have it every once in a while, that's what's going on. Uh, for me, I just always have low blood pressure. So that's probably my deal. Um, but yeah, sound good? Oh yeah, also vasovagal reactions may play into this. Do you guys understand vasovagal reactions? as much as anybody understands vasal vagal reactions, which is not much. Inappropriate stimulation of the vagus nerve, increasing your parasympathetic response, and causing a, a decrease in level of consciousness. Okay. We ready to move along? See how far we can do this? Okay, shock. Now, we did mention shock last week, so this is going to be just an elaboration of what we actually talked about just for our treatment modalities, how ideology plays into deciding our treatment modalities. Shock as a whole just means that you're not getting enough oxygen there. It's not getting there. The mechanism by which it's not getting there, those are diverse. Maybe your heart, maybe your cardiac output isn't high enough to get oxygen out to tissue. Maybe the blood is poorly distributed for some reason. Maybe their blood's getting there, but it's got reduced oxygen content. So I actually like this little Pac-Man image for our different forms of shock. So there's, for example, hypovolemic shock. It just mean you have low blood volume. A really obvious example of this would be if somebody stabbed you and you're bleeding out. But a less obvious way that you would have hypovolemic shock is uh, like a slow bleed, or just hypovolemia in general. Slow bleed. Yep. Like mm -hmm. Internal bleeding, internal doesn't necessarily mean slow. Yep. Cardiogenic shock 
means your heart's not pumping. So our most common one for this would probably be myocardial infarction or maybe like a cardiac tamponade, something that's preventing the cardiomyocytes from filling and then contracting, filling and then contracting. If it can't do that, then it can't push blood forward and you're not oxygenating your tissues. And then distributive shock is going to be related to the vascular space. And again, we haven't had inflammation yet, so we haven't had sepsis yet, uh, but that's gonna be an example. If you have widespread vasodilation and suddenly all of the fluid is leaking out of your blood vessels and into your interstitium, that's distributive shock. A couple of different things are gonna cause distributive shock, not just sepsis, but sepsis is a good example of your, all of your blood vessels dilate at the same time. That increases the space between endothelial cells and fluid leaks out into the interstitium. Now it's in the interstitium, it's in that compartment, instead of being in your blood vessel compartment. Anaphylaxis too, and that's coming up, yeah. Uh, the other one that's not perfectly represented here is obstructive shock, which means maybe a pulmonary embolus. Now you're going to see a gray area here in a couple of these actually, pulmonary embolus, cardiac tamponade. Uh, different sources will put those in different categories. I think cardiac tamponade belongs in cardiogenic because the thing that's causing the sh shock is your heart's not ejecting blood properly. <laughs> it, it's never been an issue, say it that way. Uh, I just want you to be aware of this. I've, I've gone to outside sources, I've got some resources on here, and you're gonna be like, why is that on that slide? That's ridiculous. Uh, so we'll just look at it. Now again, if you're lacking oxygen, everything we talked about last week, with uh, anaerobic metabolism, not producing ATP, not being able to power pumps, hydrobic swelling, free radical production, and uh, macrophage induction, that's gonna be related to inflammation reactions. We'll see that more next week. And of course, I think I did mention the reperfusion injury when you reintroduce oxygen, but your ions like calcium are now on the wrong side of the plasma membrane. Calcium plus oxygen is gonna produce some free radicals and you're gonna have destabilization of some molecules. Our signs and symptoms related to shock, again, they're largely compensatory. If there's a theme here, it's cause and effect. Make sure that you understand the shock happened first, the lack of oxygen happened first, and then the rest of these things happened next. Right? The level of consciousness went down because there's no oxygen. The respiratory rate went up because your lungs are trying to compensate. Your urine output decreased. Maybe that's not the first thing you notice about this person, but eventually you may measure that their urinary output has decreased because you're trying to keep the fluid inside, right? You don't want to get rid of the fluid if the fluid's not going anywhere, right? If the fluid's in the wrong space or if you're low on fluid. And so on. So here's cardiogenic shock. And again, this is one of those sources where we got something kind of wacky going on. Cardiogenic shock mostly associated with myocardial infarction. Myocardial infarction means we cut off blood flow to part of the heart wall. Those cells died and they lost their contractile ability. These are muscle cells. These are adult cardiomyocytes. They are non-mitotic. They're not coming back. They're getting replaced by scar tissue. So that's why a quick treatment of myocardial infarction while the cells are still dying is very, very important to long-term outcomes. So here are some examples of cardiogenic shock and let's find the problem with this. So infarcts, obviously, left ventricular infarct, right ventricular infarct, those are the ones that are pushing blood out of the heart. Here's cardiac tamponade, I agree with this one. Uh, again, some people put that under a different category, which is a little bit weird, but what can you do? Cardiac tamponade just means that the pericardium has filled with fluid. We will address this again during our heart lecture, by the way. This is filled with fluid and that means it's restricting the heart. The heart can't fill with blood and if the heart can't fill with blood, then it can't eject blood. Cardiac output's greatly decreased. Problems with your mitral valve, 
Um, and then if you have regurgitation, the blood may not go forward, it may go backwards. And they actually have a pulmonary embolism up here, which is a little bit weird. So maybe because it's in the great vessels very closely associated with the heart, and it's still the heart can't push blood forward, it can't push blood into the lungs, therefore it can't come back to the left side of the heart. That may be why they decided to put there, that there. But you would also call pulmonary embolism obstructive. It's a literal obstruction. It's in the name, right? So that's where that gray area comes in, and I just want you to be aware that that exists. With cardiogenic shock, our goal here uh, is going to be about restoring the vasculature of the coronary arteries, restoring blood flow to the heart muscle without causing a reperfusion injury, preferably. It's going to just be about uh, drugs that fix the heart. Fix the heart, and then you fix the shock. And again, anytime I have clinical things like this, if somebody tells you otherwise, listen to them. One thing I'm going to talk about with hypovolemic shock is you're going to give them fluids and add it into it. But I have looked into this, and sometimes we do give fluids to people in cardiogenic shock. So don't just take my word for it. Not a clinician. Uh, so far, so good? Okay. Obstructive shock means there's some kind of blockage. And again, they've put cardiac tamponade here. It's blocking something, sure, but I maybe disagree with putting this here. It just means there's a block. Mechanical obstruction that prevents active cardiac filling, stroke volume, prevents blood from getting to where it's trying to get to. Hypovolemic, maybe you got stabbed. Maybe you got shot. Um, yep, pretty much. Burns. Burns actually leak a lot of fluids. We're actually going to worry about blood volume with burns. Dehydration. Or leaking fluid into interstitial spaces. Again, you're going to spend a lot of time watching where those fluids go. It's going to matter a lot. Distributive. There's three major types of distributive shock. Anaphylactic like we had from the back. That means there's a major widespread allergic reaction that caused widespread vasodilation. Neurogenic. You got conked on the head, and now all of the neurological and endocrine controls of blood pressure that are sourced from your brain are impacted. Now you dysregulate the autonomic nervous system and that causes your body to have widespread vasodilation. Or septic shock, the inflammation reaction is system-wide and causes widespread vasodilation. So all of them are about widespread vasodilation. And again, because they have different etiologies, we do have different treatments even within distributive shock. If it's anaphylactic shock, we need to treat the allergen. If it's neurogenic shock, we need to treat the brain injury. And if it's septic shock, we need to treat the infection. And that's it. Any questions before I turn off the recording? <laughs>